I was reluctant to be present when he first met his sister and Ham, so I decided to call on Mr. Omer, and remembering his interest in Emily, I told him what had happened. Oh, ho, ho, that's the best news I've heard for many a day, sir. Oh, ho, ho, yes. Yeah, my stars. What's going to be done for that unfortunate young woman, Martha? Hmm? I can't tell you yet, but I'm sure Mr. Peggotty hasn't forgotten her. Oh, cause whatever is done, I, I'd wish to be a member of. Oh, yes. Do you put me down for anything you may consider right and let me know? Thank you, sir. Oh, you know, sir, I see more of the world in this here chair than ever I see out of it. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised at the number of people that looks in of a day to have a chat. There's twice as much in the newspaper as there used to be. And as to general reading, oh, my heart life, what a lot I get through. <laughs> and since I've took to reading, you've took to writing, eh, sir? <laughs> what a lovely work that were of yours. Oh. <laughs> I read every word, every word. <laughs> and as to feeling sleepy, oh, not at all. I expressed my satisfaction, but I must confess... I found this association of ideas significant. After a stroll about the town, I went to Ham's house, where I found Peggotty alone. Oh, Master Davy, Master Davy, thank God she's been found. Thank God Darnell saved her. Oh, thank God indeed. Is Ham not home, Peggotty? Oh, he's just stepped out to take a turn on the beach. Mm. How is he? He don't show it much, but I believe he's broken-hearted. He... Sometimes he talk of old times in the boathouse, and then he speak of Emily as a child, but he don't speak of her as a woman. Never. Oh. Master Davy! Ah, my old friend! Boy, sir, that's, that's good to see you. <laughs> Uncle's down in the boathouse, making ready to leave for her. Yes, I know. You'll miss him. Mm, no, that we will. But you're right to us. We'll have his letters. And maybe he'll get rich in the new country. <laughs> <laughs> you're staying here for long, sir? Just a few days. I'll see your room, Davy. I'd take it kindly if, um, if we could have a few words about it all. But not here, no. Not now. I understand. Can we meet tomorrow, in the evening? Yes. Um... Will you wait for me on the beach? By the old boat? I shall be there. Right. Master Davy. Ham. It was about... about her. Shall you see her, do you think? It would be too painful for her, perhaps. Ah, oh, yes. So toward, so toward. But Ham... If there's anything I could write to her for you, if there's anything you wish to make known to her through me... Oh, thank you, sir. Most kind. I think there is something I could wish said or wrote. What is it? Ain't that I forgive her? Ain't that so much? Oh, Tis more as I beg of her to forgive me... <laughs> have impressed my affections on her. Odd times I think that if I hadn't had a promise for her to marry me, she was that trustful of me in a friendly way, she'd have, she'd have told me what was struggling in her mind and, and would have counselled with me and, and I, I might have saved her. I will tell her. Is there anything else? Yes, if I can say it, I... I loved her. And I love the memory of her. Too deep to be able to lead her to believe of her own self that I'm a happy man. I could only be happy by forgetting of her, and I'm afraid I couldn't hardly bear if she should be told I'd done that. But if you, being so full of learning could think of anything to say as might bring her to believe I weren't greatly hurt, still loving her and mourning for her, anything as might ease a sorrowful mind and yet not make you think as I could ever marry. 
Oh, anyone could beat me. What she was. I, I, I should ask of you to say that. With my prayers for her, as was so dear. I will try to do that, Ham. Thank you, sir. Oh, it was kind of you to bear him company here. I'm not like to see him again. We well, don't say so, but so twill be, and that so. The last you see on him, the very last, will you give him the lovingest duty and thanks of the orphan he was more than a father to? I will. Oh, thank you, sir. You'll see them at the boathouse now? Yes. I... I won't go with you. I can't go there no more. I... I understand. Goodbye, then. Goodbye, sir. God bless you. Ah, come according to promise to bid farewell to the old boat, eh, Master Davy? Fair enough now, isn't it? It's bare indeed. You've made good use of your time. Oh, we haven't been idle. I don't know what Mrs. Gummidge Ant worked like. <laughs> Dan. Yes, Martha. My dear Dan. Mm. The parting words I speak in this year house is, I mun be left behind. More that you Don't know... he think of leaving me behind. Oh, Donald, don't he ever do it. Me good soul. Take you... me along with you. With you and Emily. I'd, I'd be your servant, constant and true. But if there's slaves in them parts, I'll be bound to you for one and be happy. But... Don't he leave me behind, Donald. There's a dairy dead. Oh, you don't know what a long voyage, what a hard life it is. Oh, that I do. And if you don't take me, I shall go into the house and die. Oh. I can take, I can work, I, I can live hard. I can, I can be loving and patient now if you'll only try me. Oh, I know you think I'm blown and lorn, but... Terry loved him so no more. I ain't sat here so long a, a watching and a thinking of your trials without some good being done me. And and I, I knows your ways and Emily's and, and I, I know your sorrows and can be a comfort at times. Oh, Donald, dearie Donald, let me go along with you. Well, well, me old mother, if so be as that's what you wish, you come with us and welcome. Oh, <laughs> oh Dan. God bless you. We put the candle out, fastened the door on the outside, and left the old boat, a dark speck in the cloudy night. And now Mr. Micawber's mystery week was at an end. We were disposed to leave my aunt at home to look after Dora, allowing Mr. Dick and me to represent her in Canterbury. But Dora wouldn't hear of it. I won't speak to you, Aunt Betsy. Oh. I'll make Jip bark at you all day. I'll be sure you really are a cross old thing if you don't go. Oh, Blossom, you know you can't do without me. Yes, I can. You're no use to me at all. Oh, gracious. You never run up and down stairs for me all day long. Blossom. You never sit and tell me stories about Dodie when he was a little boy with his shoes worn out, all covered with dust. You never do anything to please me, do you? Oh, my dear! Yes, you do, Aunt. I'm only teasing you. <laughs> but you must go. Why shouldn't you both go, Dodie? I'm not very ill, am I? Uh, what a question! What a fancy! I know, I'm silly. Well then, you must go. So we agreed that we'd both go, and that Dora was a little imposter, who pretended not to be well because she liked to be petted. She was very pleased by this, and very merry. And we four, my aunt, Mr Dick, Traddles and I, went down to Canterbury by the Dover Mail. Next morning, at the first chime of the half hour, Mr. Micawber appeared. Gentlemen and madam, good morning. Uh, uh, this is Mr. Dick, <laughs> Mr. Micawber, an old and dear friend. I am delighted to make his acquaintance. <laughs> Have you breakfasted, sir? Have a chop? No, sir. 
Not for the world. Appetite and myself have long been strangers, Mr. Dixon. <laughs> Dick, attention. Oh, yes, indeed. <clears throat> now, sir, we are ready for Mount Vesuvius or anything else, as soon as you please. Madam, I trust you will shortly witness an eruption. Good heavens. Mr. Treadles, I believe I have your permission to mention that we have been in communication. Of course. Mr. McCorber has consulted me, Copperfield, and I have advised him to the best of my judgment. Unless I deceive myself, Mr. Treadles, what I contemplate is a disclosure of an important nature. Oh, highly so. Perhaps under such circumstances, madam and gentlemen, you will do me the honour to submit yourselves to the direction of one who, however unworthy to be regarded in any other light but as waif and stray, is still your fellow man. We perfect confidence in you, Mr. McCorber, and we'll do as you please. Mr. Copperfield, I would beg to be allowed a start of five minutes by the clock and then to receive the present company inquiring for Miss Wickfield at the office of Wickfield and Heap, whose stipendiary I am. For the moment, farewell. How do you do, Mr. McCorber? Mr. Copperfield, I hope I see you well. Is Miss Wickfield at home? Yes. Mr. Wickfield is unwell in bed, sir, of a rheumatic fever. Oh. But I have no doubt Miss Wickfield will be happy to see old friends. Will you walk, sir? This way. Miss Trotwood, Mr. David Copperfield, Mr. Thomas Traddles, and Mr. Dixon. <laughs> Well, well, I'm sure this is an unexpected pleasure. Mr. Copperfield, I hope I see you well, and if I may humbly express myself so, friendly towards them, as is ever your friend. <laughs> Miss Trotwood, things are changed in this office since I was a numble clerk and held your pony, ain't they? But I am not changed. Sir, I think you're pretty consistent to the promise of your youth, if that's any satisfaction to you. Thank you, Miss Trotwood, for your good opinion. <sighs> Mikorba, tell him to let Miss Agnes know. And Mother, Mother will be in quite a state when she sees the present company. You aren't busy, Mr Heath? No, Mr Traddles, not so much as I could wish. But lawyers, sharks and leeches are not easily satisfied, you know. Not but what myself and Micawber have our hands full in general on account of Mr Wickfield being hardly fit for any occupation. But it's a pleasure as well as a duty to work for him. <laughs> You've not been intimate with Mr Wickfield, I think, Mr Traddles. I've only had the honour of seeing you once myself. No, I haven't been intimate with Mr Wickfield. Or I might have waited on you long ago, Mr. Heap. Huh? <laughs> I'm sorry for that, Mr. Traddles. You'd have admired him as much as we all do. His little failings would only have endeared him to you the more. Oh, Miss Agnes, we have friends here, as you see. Miss Trotwood. <laughs> my dear. Mr. Dick. At your service, ma'am. <laughs> How are you, my dear? I am well, thank you. Trot, how good to see you. Mr. Traddles, how are you? And Sophie? Oh, we're both in the best of health, thank you, Miss Wickfield. Uh, will you excuse me? Trot, how is Dora? She's very cheerful. I have a letter for you. Oh. Don't wait, Micawber. I told you not to wait. Did you hear me? Yes. Then why do you wait? Because, in short, I choose to. You're a dissipated fellow. All the world knows that, and I'm afraid you'll oblige me to get rid of you. Go along. I'll talk to you presently. If there's a scoundrel on this earth with whom I've already talked too much, that scoundrel's name is he. Huh? Ah. This is a conspiracy. You've met here by appointment. Have you, Copperfield? Take care. You'll make nothing of this. We understand each other, you and me. There's no love between us. At last you've spoken the truth, Uriah. At least in one particular. Mr. Micawber, deal with him as he deserves. 
You're a precious set of people, ain't you? To buy over my clerk, who's the scum of society, as you were yourself, Copperfield, before anyone had charity on you. To defame me with his lies. <laughs> Miss Trotwood, you'd better stop this, or I'll stop your husband shorter than will be pleasant to you. What? I won't know your story professionally for nothing, old lady. Oh Miss Wickfield... If you've any love for your father, don't join that gang, or I'll ruin him. <laughs> now come, I've got some of you under the harrow. Think twice before it goes over you. Mrs Heath is here, sir. I've taken the liberty of making myself known to Who her. are you to make yourself known? I am the agent and friend of Mr Wickfield, sir. I've obtained a power of attorney for him, and uh -huh. I have it in my pocket. The old ass has drunk himself into a state of dotage. It has been got from him by fraud. Something has been got from him by fraud, I know. And so do you, Mr Heap. We'll refer that question to Mr Micawber. You're hold your tongue, Mother. You're Will you hold your tongue and leave it to me? Copperfield? Do you think it justifiable, you who pride yourself so much on your honour and all the rest of it... To sneak about my place, eavesdropping with my clerk. You don't think of what I shall do in return. Very well, we shall see. Mr. What's your name? You are going to refer some question to Micorba. Why don't you make him speak? Dear Miss Trotwood and gentlemen, in appearing before you to denounce probably the most consummate villain that has ever existed, I ask no consideration for myself. The victim from my cradle of pecuniary liabilities to which I have been unable to respond, I have ever been the sport and toy of debasing circumstances. Ignominy, want, Despair and madness have, collectively or separately, been the attendants of my career. In an accumulation of ignominy, want, despair and madness, I entered the office of the firm and nominally conducted under the appellation of Wickfield and Heap, but in reality, wielded by Heap alone. Heap <laughs> and only Heap is the mainspring of that machine. <laughs> Heap and only <laughs> Heap is the forger and the cheat. Give me that. Indeed I will not, sir, but this you may have. I, the devil take you. I'll be even with you. Approach me again, you, you, heap of infamy. And if your head is human, I'll break it. Hark to this. The stipendiary emoluments, in consideration of which I entered into the service of Heap, were not defined beyond the pittance of 22 shillings and six per week. The rest was left contingent on the value of my professional exertions. In other words, the baseness of my nature, the cupidity of my motives, the poverty of my family, and the general moral, or rather immoral, resemblance between myself and Heap. Need I say, it soon became necessary for me to solicit pecuniary advances towards the support of Mrs. Micawber and my family. Need I say that those advances were secured by IOUs and similar legal acknowledgments, and that I thus became enmeshed in the web that Heap had spun for my reception? Then it was that my services were called in for the falsification of business and the mystification of an individual I will designate as Mr. W. Mr. W. was imposed upon, kept in ignorance and deluded in every possible way. Yet all this while the ruffian heap was professing gratitude and friendship to this much abused gentleman. My object when the contest within myself between stipend and no stipend ceased, was to discover and expose the major wrongs committed against Mr. W. by heap. Stimulated by the silent monitor within and a no less appealing monitor without, to whom I will briefly refer as Miss W., I entered on a not unlaborious task of clandestine investigation. My charges against Heap are as follows. Oh, oh, never, never, not my Yuri. First, oh, no. 
When Mr. W.'s faculties and memory for business became weakened and confused, Heap deliberately complicated the whole of the official transaction. When Mr. W. was least fit to enter into business, Heap was always on hand to force him into it. He obtained Mr. W.'s signature to documents of importance, representing them as documents of no importance. He induced Mr. W. to empower him to draw out one particular sum of trust money and employed it to meet pretended business charges which had never really existed. He gave this proceeding the appearance of originating in Mr. W.'s own dishonest intention and has used it ever since... To torture him. You shall prove this, you, Copperfield, if you can. Mr. Turtles, ask Heap who lived in his house after him. The fool himself and lives there now. Ask him if he ever kept a pocketbook in that house or if he ever burnt one there. If he says yes and asks you where the ashes are, refer him to Wilkins Micawber and he will hear something not at all to his advantage. You'll be humble and make terms, Mother, my dear. will you be quiet? You're in a fright and don't know what you're saying. Humble. I've humbled some of them for a pretty long time back. Humble as I was. Second, Heap has on several occasions, to the best of my knowledge, information and belief... That won't do. We will endeavour to find something that will do. And do for you, sir, finally, very shortly. Second... Heap has, on several occasions, to the best of my knowledge, information and belief, systematically forged to various entries, books and documents, the signature of Mr. W. And has distinctly done so in one instance capable of proof by me. A bond which he proposed to put forward as a sum advanced by him to save Mr. W. from dishonour has signatures to this instrument purporting to have been executed by Mr. W. and witnessed by Wilkins Macoba. They are forgeries oh, no. by him. Oh. I never attested any such document. I have in my possession, in Heap's hand and pocketbook, several similar imitations of Mr. W's signature. And I have the document itself in my possession. That is, I had it till early this morning. I have now relinquished it to Mr. Traddles. Quite true. Yuri, Yuri, be humble and make terms. I, I know my son will be humble, gentlemen, if you give him time to think. Mother, <laughs> you'd have done better to fire a loaded gun yeah, at my but head. I love you, Yuri, and I can't bear to hear you provoking the yeah. gentleman. I, I, I told mm. that gentleman there that I'd answer for your being humble and making amends. And, oh, see how humble I am, gentlemen. Don't mind Copperfield him. would have given you a hundred pounds to say less than you've blurted yeah, out. God. Help it, Yuri. I, I can't see you running into danger through carrying your head so high. Better be humble as you always was. What more have you got to bring forward, if anything? Get on with it. Third and last. I'm now in a condition to show by Heap's false books that Mr. W has for years been deluded and plundered by Heap that the object of Heap was to subdue Mr. and Miss W. entirely to himself. His last act was to induce Mr. W. to relinquish his share in the partnership for a certain annuity to be paid by Heap. We'll see about that, Micawber. There's a law against slander, you know. What? Huh? Where are the books? Some thief has stolen the book. I did, when you gave me the key this morning. Don't be alarmed, Mr. Heap. I have them. I'll take good care of them. You receive stolen goods, do you? Under such circumstances, yes. <laughs> well, Copperfield, are you satisfied? What do you want done? I'll tell you what must be done. Has Copperfield no tongue? First, the deed of relinquishment must be given to me now. Here. Suppose I haven't got it. But you have, so we won't suppose so. Then you must disgorge all your greed has gained you and make reparation to the last farthing. Hmm? All the partnership books and papers must stay in our possession. <laughs> all money, accounts uh... and securities. In short, everything here. Oh, I must have time to think about that. Certainly. Uh... 
In the meantime, we shall keep them. And you must keep your room and communicate with no one. I won't do it. Maidstone Jail is a safe place of detention. And though the law may be longer in writing us, there's no doubt of its punishing you. Copperfield, will you be so good as to go to the guild hall and bring a couple of officers? Oh, no! No! Oh, Miss Wickfield, dear Miss Wickfield, tell him not to do any such thing. It's all true, but he's very humble, and if he won't do what you want, I will. Stop, I will. Mother, I will. hold your noise. No, no, don't well, <laughs> let him have that deed. Go and fetch it. Help her, Mr. Dick. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, oh, come, you're Mrs. Oh, Heap. Oh, you're, you're... Copperfield, I've always hated you. You've always been an upstart, and you've always been against me. And in your greed and cunning, you've always been against the world. Greed and cunning always overreach themselves. It's as sure as death. Or as sure as they used to teach at school from nine to eleven that labour was a curse, and from eleven to one that it was a blessing and a dignity, and I don't know what. You preach about as consistent as they did. Won't humbleness go down? I shouldn't have got round my gentleman fellow partner without it, I think. Micawber, I'll pay you. Mr. Copperfield, evil is defeated and right has triumphed. <laughs> I am a man again. Might I persuade you to do me the honour of attending me to my present domicile, to witness the re-establishment of mutual confidence between myself and Mrs. Micawber? The veil that has long been interposed between us is now withdrawn, and my children and the author of their being can once more come into contact on equal terms. Emma, my love, I have returned. Oh, the corbel, husband. The cloud has passed from my mind. Oh. Mutual confidence so long preserved between us is restored. Oh, Macorber. Now, welcome poverty. Oh. Welcome misery. Welcome houselessness. Um. Welcome hunger and rags, tempest and beggary. Ah, uh, Mutual confidence will sustain us to the end. Mrs. Micawber, I'm delighted to see you. My aunt, Miss Betsy Trotwood, Mrs. Micawber. Oh, ma'am, oh. I'm honoured. And may I present Mr. Dick? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Dick, attention. <clears throat> ma'am, we are all very grateful to your husband. Oh, I'm glad. Oh, oh, forgive me, but I'm not strong. And the removal of the late misunderstanding between Mr. Micawber and myself is almost too much for me. Oh, of course, my <sighs> dear Mrs. Micawber. Uh, I had not realised the extent of Mr. Micawber's family commitment. I wonder you have never turned your thoughts to emigration. Madam, it was the dream of my youth and the fallacious aspiration of my riper years. Why, what a thing it would be for yourselves and your family, Mr. and Mrs. Micawber, if you were to emigrate now. Oh. Capital, madam. That is the difficulty. Mm. Capital? But you have done us a great service. What could we do for you that would be half so good as to find the capital? <laughs> Miss oh, Trotwood. Miss Trotwood! I could not receive it as a gift, but if a sufficient sum could be advanced, say at 4% interest per annum upon my personal liability, say my notes of hand, at 12, 18, and 24 months respectively, to allow time for something to turn up... Put me... Well, can be and shall be on your own terms. We can see to that, can't we, Trotwood? Indeed we can. Oh. I've been fortunate these last years, Mr. Micawber, as you know. Oh. Some people Trotwood knows are going out to Australia shortly. Why shouldn't you go in the same ship? <laughs> oh, think about now, it. Now, there is but one question, my dear ma'am, I could wish to ask. Mm -hmm. The climate, I believe, is healthy. Oh, finest in the world. Just so. Then my question arises. Are the circumstances of the country such that a man of Mr. Micawber's abilities would have a fair chance of rising in the social scale? 
I will not say at present might he aspire to governor, but would there be a reasonable opening for his talents to develop themselves? No better opening anywhere for a man who conducts himself well and is industrious. For a man who conducts himself well and is industrious. Precisely, it is evident to me that Australia is the legitimate sphere of action for Mr. Macorba. Shall I ever forget how, in a moment, he was the most sanguine of men? Or how Mrs. Macorba presently discoursed about the habits of the kangaroo? But I must pause now. As other memories fade, and a figure comes forward, quiet and still, saying, Stop to think of me. Turn to look upon the blossom as it flutters to the ground. There, Jip. There. Let my hair loose, Dodie. I'm tired of having it in a net now. Yes, my darling. There. I remember how you asked me for a lock of it soon after we first met. You said it was beautiful. And so it is still. That was the day I told you how much in love I was. Yes, it was. Dodie. Yes, dearest. Are you lonely when you go downstairs now? How can I not be when I see your empty chair? You truly miss me. Even stupid me. My heart. Who is there on earth I could miss so much? I'm so glad, yet so sorry. Give Agnes my dear love and tell her I want very much to see her and I've nothing left to wish for. Except to get well again. Oh, Dodie. Sometimes I think that will never be. Oh, don't say so, dearest love. Don't think so. I'm going to say something I've often thought of. Uh, you won't mind. Mind, my darling. Be because I don't know what you'll think. Dodie, dear, I'm afraid I was too young. Dora, my heart. I, I don't mean... In years only. I was such a silly little creature. I'm afraid it, it would have been better if we'd only loved each other as a boy and girl. I've begun to think I wasn't fit to be a wife. Oh, Dora, love. As fit as I am to be a husband. Oh, but you're very clever. And I never was. We've been very happy, my sweet Dora. I was very happy, yes. But as years went on, my boy would have wearied of his child wife. No. It's better as it is. Dora, dearest, don't speak like that. Every word seems a reproach. Oh, no. I loved you far too well to say a reproachful word to you in earnest. And you never deserved it. Don't cry. <laughs> Oh, 
Jody. After more years, you never could have loved me better. And I might have so tried and disappointed you that you wouldn't have loved me half so well. It is better as it is. Agnes is with her now. I sit by the fire, thinking with a blind remorse of the secret feelings I've had since my marriage. I think of every little trifle between me and Dora and feel the truth that trifles make the sum of life. Jip, you want to go upstairs? Not tonight. No, not tonight. Oh, Jip, it may be never again. Poor little dog. Jip. Oh, Jip. No, not to you. Agnes, look, little Jip, he... he... Agnes! <laughs> no! <laughs> no! <laughs> that face, so full of pity and of grief, that rain of tears, that solemn hand upraised towards heaven. It is over. Darkness comes before my eyes, and for a time all things are blotted out of my remembrance. Have you thought any more about that proposal of mine? Madam, to borrow the language of an illustrious poet, our boat is on the shore and our bark is on the sea. Good. A sensible decision. Well taken. With respect to the pecuniary assistance enabling us to launch our frail canoe on the ocean of enterprise, I have reconsidered the proposition I originally submitted, notes of hand at 12, 18 and 24 months, I am apprehensive that such an arrangement might not allow time for the requisite amount of something to turn up. I therefore beg to propose an alternative. 18, 24 and 30 months. Shall we now leave Mr. Traddles to communicate all relevant business matters to Miss Wickfield and her friends? Should you require our presence, Mr. Traddles... You will find us in the adjoining room. Thank you, Mr. Micawber. Now, Agnes, my dear, let us attend to your affairs. Uh, Mr. Traddles. <clears throat> I'm happy to say, Miss Trotwood, that Mr. Wickfield has very much improved. Ah. Relieved of his anxieties, he's hardly the same person. And he's helped us a great deal in making some things clear we might have found hopeless without him. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you now that having sorted out a great mass of unintentional confusion in the first place and willful falsification in the second, it's clear that Mr Wickfield can wind up his business with no deficiency or defalcation whatever. I thank God for that. But the surplus left him will be very small. Too small to support him. I suppose the house to be sold even in saying this. Dear Mr Traddles, I can wish for nothing more once Papa is free with honour. Mm. I'll take our future on myself. Oh, but, Agnes, my dear, have you thought how? I have. If I rent the dear old house and keep a school, I'll be useful and happy. If you're sure that it's best for your father to relinquish his business. I am. Hmm. 
Let me go next, Miss Trotwood, to that property of yours. <sighs> Mr. Traddles, if it's gone, I can bear it, and if it isn't, I'll be glad to get it back. It was originally £8,000 consoles. Right. I can't account for more than five. Thousand or pounds? Five thousand pounds. It was all there was. I sold three myself. One to pay for Trotwood's education and the other two I have by me. Then I'm delighted to say we've recovered all the money. Uh, how? Well, you believed it had been misappropriated by Mr Whitfield. Indeed I did. Miss Trotwood. Hush, I said never a word. Please. Hush, Agnes. It was sold by Uriah Heap. Mr. Wickfield was persuaded by that rascal that he'd taken the money to conceal other deficiencies and difficulties. My poor friend, Mr. Wickfield, wrote me a mad letter charging himself with robbery. So I paid him a visit and burnt his letter in front of him. I told him if he could ever write me and himself to do it. And if not, to keep his own counsel for his daughter's sake. Do you tell me you have really got the money back? Yes. We had so much against Uriah, he couldn't escape us. And what has become of him now? He left here with his mother by the night coach for London, cursing me and Mr Micawber to the heavens. Mm. And now, uh, touching Mr Micawber, uh, what would you give him? Well, I advise you to give him a sum not too large in money. And we will also pay his passage and outfit his family. Yes, let him pay the amount off as he suggests. It'll be good for him to have the responsibility. Miss Trotwood, there is one other thing. Hmm? I recall that Uriah mentioned your husband. Perhaps it was mere purposeless impertinence? No. Ah, there really was such a person. Yes. Can I do anything to help? No, but thank you many times. Uh, let us have Mr and Mrs Micawber back now, and we will tell them the arrangements we propose. Next day, my aunt and I returned to London. We went back to her house, not to mine, and before going to bed we sat alone, as of old. Trot? Yes, aunt? Do you really want to know what I have had on my mind lately? Indeed I do. If there was ever a time I didn't want you to have a sorrow I couldn't share, it's now. You have had enough sorrow of your own without my little miseries. Oh. That was my only motive in keeping anything from you. I know that. But tell me now. I need your company tomorrow. Will you travel a little way with me in the morning? Of course. Gladly. At nine. I will tell you then. This is a cheerless morning for you, Trot. A hospital and a funeral. We are taking him to Hornsey. He was born there. When did he die, Aunt? The night before we went to Canterbury. This time he knew it was his last illness. He asked them to send for me, Trot. He was sorry then. Very sorry. I was with him a good deal. Aunt, dear aunt, I wish you'd confided in me. To bear this alone. Oh, Trot, you had your own sorrows. Oh, no one can harm him now. Six and thirty years ago, this day, I was married to him. God forgive us all. Oh, Aunt. <laughs> oh, he was a fine-looking man when I married him. And he was sadly changed. <laughs> After the relief of tears, she became composed. Her nerves were a little shaken, she said, or she wouldn't have given way. God forgive us all. And now I come to an event in my life, so indelible, so awful, that from the beginning of my story I have seen its shadow growing longer and longer as it came nearer, 
like a great tower in a plain. For years after it happened, I dreamed of it often. I dream of it sometimes to this hour. I had written to Emily. I told her I had seen Ham, and I told her of his message, and I sent the letter to Mr. Peggotty. Master Davy, I give Emily a letter. She wrote this here for Ham, and begged of me for you to read it, and if you see no hurt in it, to be so kind as to take charge on it. Have you read it? Yes, sir. Ham, I have got your message. What can I write to thank you for your good and blessed kindness to me? I have put the words close to my heart. I shall keep them till I die. Goodbye forever, in this world. In another world, if I am forgiven, I may wake a child again and come to you. All thanks and blessings. Farewell. Evermore. Master Davy, may I tell her as you be so kind as to take charge, Aunt? Yes. I'll go down to Yarmouth tonight. Oh, sir, she wouldn't ask that. The journey's nothing. There's time for me to go and come back before the ship sails. I'm restless. It'll help me. Then I can tell her before you go that Ham has her letter. Oh, thank you, sir. That would be a kindness to both of them. That's a very remarkable sky, coachman. I don't remember to have ever seen one like it. Not I. Not equal to it. That's wind, sir. There'll be mischief done at sea, I expect, before long. As the night advanced, the clouds closed in and densely overspread the whole sky. It came on to blow harder and harder. Coachman! Sir! Are we safe? I've never known such a wind. I fear we'll be blown over. We must trust in the Lord, sir. We change horses at Ipswich. We're many hours late, but we're near there now. This is a storm like I've never seen. But I hope as we can get to Yarmouth tomorrow morning. Long before we came to the coast, sea spray was upon our lips. The mighty wind was blowing dead on shore, and over miles of flat country round Yarmouth, the waters were out. Every sheet and puddle lashed its banks and had its little breakers setting heavily towards us. And so at last, we came to the sea. The street outside the old inn was strewn with sand and seaweed. I made my way to the beach. Oh, God preserve him! God save him! What's the matter? My husband's out in a herring boat in this sea. Let me help you home. No, I couldn't wait under a roof while he's in such danger. <laughs> the tremendous sea confounded me. As the high watery walls came rolling in, they looked as if the least would engulf the town. When the billows dashed themselves to pieces, every fragment seemed possessed by the full might of the whole. I seemed to see a rending and upheaval of all nature. Boatman! Uh-huh. Ham Peggotty! Do you know him? Everyone know Ham, God bless him. But you won't find him. Eh? His yard sent him to Lowestoft for to repair his safe. Will he come back tonight? Oh, not in this air, Gale. No more was set out in this. I went back to the old inn and spent an anxious day, disturbed by the growing violence of the storm and the tumult of my own unhappy thoughts. At night I could not sleep at first, but finally fatigue overcame me, and I fell into a dream of a siege of some town where cannons were roaring at the gates. Sir! Sir! What? <coughs> what time is it? Nine in the morning, sir. There's a wreck close by. What? A wreck? A schooner from Spain, they say. Do you make a, sir, if you want to see her? They told me there was a wreck. That's you, sir. To the last. See? Great heavens! She was close in on us. One mast was broken off. It lay over the side in a maze of sail and rigging. And as the ship rolled, it beat against it with a dreadful violence. And now the sea had swept over it and carried men, spars, casks and planks into the boiling surge. 
sheep part in the midships now. Hey, there's one mast still standing. There's four of them still alive. Look, clinging to the rigging. There were indeed four men there as he spoke. One of them, the man that had been most active before the fatal wave, a tall figure with long curling hair. As she rolled, her bell sounded. It seemed a death knell, for once again the sea swept over her, and two men were gone. The two remaining clung to the rigging. What can we do? Those two poor lost creatures. We can't let them perish. I don't know what we can do, Arthur. The lifeboat was manned in our sense, but it could do nothing. There's nothing to it out. Save a man waiting out with a rope to them two lost souls. And like as not, they still go, and he'd go with them. Will you fetch me a rope, lad? Ham! Fast baby! No! No, don't let him go! Good people, there's no hope. It would be murder! Oh, oh no, the man's gone! God rest his soul. There's just one poor sailor now. Fast baby. If my time is calm, it is calm. If ain't, I'll abide it. Lord above, bless you and bless all. Mates, make me ready! I am going off! Home! I was swept away from him. Men ran with ropes and hid him from me. Then I saw him standing alone, a rope in his hand, another round his body, which several men held slack on the shore. Ham watched the sea until there was a great retreating wave. Then he dashed in after it. He made for the wreck, rising with the hills, falling with the valleys. The distance was nothing, but the power of the sea and wind made the strife deadly. The solitary man at the mast waved to us. His action brought an old remembrance to my mind. Ham was so near now. One more vigorous stroke and he'd be clinging to the wreck. God save his soul! A vast green hillside of water had rolled in from beyond the ship. And now the ship was gone. And Ham... Where was Ham? They hauled him in. They drew him to my very feet. Battered. Insensible. He was carried to the nearest house, and I went with them. They tried to revive him, but that generous heart had been stilled forever. I stayed until hope was abandoned, and all was done. Mr. Copperfield, sir. Ben. This is a terrible thing. So tis, sir. So tis. But will you come out to the beach? To the beach? Yes. Does a body come ashore? Do I know it? He answered nothing, but he led me to the shore. And there... Where Emily and I, two children, had looked for shells. Where some lighter fragments of the old boat blown down last night had been scattered by the wind. There, among the ruins of the home he had wronged, I saw Steerforth. Lying with his head upon his arm, as I had often seen him lie in far-off days at school. They carried him to the inn. They knew it was not right to take him to the quiet room where Ham lay. The care of all that was left lay with me. Mr. Omer arranged a conveyance to take him to London. I travelled with it. The bleak night and the open country surrounded me, and the ashes of my youthful friendship. On a mellow autumn day, about noon, I arrived in Highgate. I walked the last mile to his mother's house, thinking of what I had to do. The little parlour-maid let me in. I beg your pardon, sir. Are you ill? I, uh, have been distressed. I'm, I'm very tired. Oh, is anything the matter, sir? Mr. James is... Hush. Yes. Something has happened that 
I have to tell Mrs. Steerforth. She is at home. Yes, sir. She's in her room. She keeps to her room now, sir. She sees no company, but she'll see you. Miss Dartle is with her. What shall I tell her? Give her my card and tell her I'll wait. In a few minutes, I stood before her. At her chair was Rosa Dartle. I'm sorry to see you are in mourning, sir. I am unhappily a widower. You're very young to know so great a loss. I'm grieved to hear it. I hope time will be good to you. I hope time will be good to all of us. Dear Mrs. Steerforth, we must all trust to that in our heaviest misfortunes. James? My son is ill. <sighs> you have seen him? I have. Are you reconciled? What? What are you telling me? Mrs. Steerforth, please... Please try to bear what I have to say. What? The night before last was dreadful at sea. If the vessel that was seen should... Should really be... The one that your son... Say what you mean. He's dead. Rosa! Now is your pride appeased. Now has he made atonement with his life. Do you hear me? His life. Oh, look at me. Look at your dead child's handiwork. Do you remember when he did this? Disfigured me for life. Look at me. Marked until I die with his high displeasure and moan and groan for what you made him. Be startled for pity's sake. Be silent, you. Look at me. Proud mother of a proud false son. Moan for your nurture of him. Moan for your corruption of him. Moan for your loss of him. Moan for mine. You resent his self-will, his haughty temper. You reared him to be what he was and stunted what he should have been. Are you rewarded now? Oh, Miss Dartle, for shame. Cruel. I have been silent all these years. I will speak now. I loved him better than you ever loved him. If I had been his wife, I could have been the slave of his caprices for a word of love a year. You were exacting, proud, and selfish. My love would have been devoted, would have trod your paltry whimpering underfoot when he was freshest and truest. He loved me. Yes, he did. When he grew weary, I grew weary. We fell away from each other without a word. Perhaps you saw it and weren't sorry. Moan. Moan for what you made him, not for your love. I tell you, time was... I loved him better than you ever did. Miss Dartle, can't you feel for this afflicted mother? Who feels for me? And if his faults... Faults? Who dares malign him? He had a soul worth millions of the friends to whom he stooped. No one can have loved him better than I did. I meant to say, if you have no compassion for his mother... I loved him. A curse on you. It was in an evil hour that you ever came here. A curse upon you. Go. Rosa knelt before Mrs. Steerforth, who stayed rigid and staring. She took her in her arms then and kissed her, rocking her on her bosom like a child. So I left them. 
I'll never leave you. Never. We both loved him. Later in the day, I returned, and we laid him in his mother's room. I went through the dreary house and darkened the windows. The windows of the chamber where he lay, I darkened last. I lifted up the leaden hand and held it to my heart, and all the world seemed death and silence. One thing more I had to do. To conceal what had happened from Mr. Peggotty and Emily, I wanted them to go on their voyage in happy ignorance. I enlisted Mr. Micawber's help in this, and he undertook to intercept any newspaper that might betray the terrible events of the storm to Mr. Peggotty. It cost me a great deal to pretend to my old friend that I had delivered Emily's letter to Ham, and that all was well. The Micawber family were lodged in a little tumble-down public house near Hungerford Stairs. We all gathered in their room the night before they were due to sail. At what time do you leave, Mr. Micawber? Madam, I am informed that we must be on board before seven tomorrow morning. Oh, as soon as that? Is it a seagoing fact, Mr. Peggotty? Tis so, ma'am. She'll drop down the river with that there tide. If Master Davy and my sister come aboard at Gravesend, afternoon and next day, they'll see the last on us. Ladies and gentlemen... I have composed a moderate portion of that beverage peculiarly associated in our minds with the roast beef of old England. In short, punch. (laughs) Under ordinary circumstances, I should scruple to entreat the indulgence of Miss Trotwood and Miss Wickfield, but... I I will drink happiness and success to you with the utmost pleasure. And so will I. Ladies, I am most grateful. Miss Trotwood... Thank you. Miss Wickfield. Thank you. Mr. Copperfield. Mr. Peggotty. Thank you, sir. Emma, my dear. Oh, Micawber, but why are you giving us pint pots? There are wine glasses enough for all of us. The luxuries of the old country we abandon. The denizens of the forest cannot expect to participate in the refinements of the land of the free. Mr. Micawber! Yes, my lad? Sentiment, it's a member of my family. If so, my dear, as the member of your family has kept us waiting for a considerable period, perhaps the member may now wait my convenience. Corber, at such a time as this. It is not meet that every nice offence should bear its comment. Emma, I stand reproved. Uh. The member of your family shall have no genial warmth frozen by me. <sighs> I hope, too, that in some branches of our family we may live again in the old country. Oh, my love. Do not frown, Mr. Micawber. I do not now refer to my own family, but to our children's children. When our race attains to eminence and fortune, I should wish that fortune to flow into the coffers of Britannia. My dear... Britannia must take her chance. She's never done much for me, so I've no particular wish on the subject. Micawber, there you are wrong. From the hour of embarkation, you should feel your position. My dear Miss Trotwood, I wish Mr. Micawber to be the Caesar of his own fortunes. I wish him to stand upon the vessel's prow and say, This country I am come to conquer... Have you honours? Have you riches? Have you posts of profitable pecuniary emolument? Let them be brought forward. They are mine. And in feeling his position, he will strengthen, not weaken, his connection with Britain. Dearest wife. Mr. Micawber will be a page of history, and as such he ought to be represented in the country that gave him birth. My love, I am always willing to defer to your good sense. (laughs) Heaven forbid... I should grudge my native country any portion of the wealth that may be accumulated by our descendants. On the afternoon of the next day, my old nurse and I travelled to Gravesend. 
When we came aboard, Mr. Peggotty was waiting for us on deck, and took us below to a strange scene, confined and dark, full of people, baggage, bundles, and barrels. Well, Master Davy, is there any last word, any forgotten thing before we part? One thing, mm. Martha. What can we do for her, Martha? Do you look over there, sir, with Mrs. Gummidge? What? You're taking her with you. <laughs> Heaven bless you. <laughs> and now, is there any other word, sir, from Ham? <laughs> Ham asked me to give you, last thing before we parted, <clears throat> the loving duty and thanks of the orphan. You were always more than a father to. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, Dano. It's many miles and many, many years as all partners now. Oh, that it is, Clara. <laughs> now, never you cry, my dear. There's them in England as needs you. And it's as dear as them that's sailing away. Uh, uh, will you be going to Yarmouth again, Master Davy? Not, not, not special, like, but if so be as... You should see how. I, uh, yes, yes. Well, tell him, uh, tell him from me and, and from one as is very dear to him. Tell him, though we be far away, there's no distance as ends love. He's always in our thoughts. He is always in our loving thoughts. Will you tell him that? Yes, Emily. God bless you always. So, that's goodbye, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Peggotty. May God protect you both. I took Peggotty on my arm and turned away. We took leave of the Micawbers and waited at a little distance to see the ship wafted on its course. It was a calm, radiant sunset, a sight at once so beautiful, so mournful, and so hopeful. The glorious ship, lying with all the life on board her, crowded at the bulwarks, bareheaded and silent. Silent only for a minute. The sails rose to the wind. The ship began to move. And then, as the ship passed, I saw her at her uncle's side, waving her last goodbye to me. Oh, Emily beautiful and drooping. Cling to him with all the trust of thy bruised heart, for he has clung to you with all the might of his great love. Goodbye. God bless you all. Bye, Master Davy. Bye, Clara. Goodbye. Bye. Surrounded by the rosy light, they solemnly passed away. The night had fallen on the Kentish hills when we were rowed ashore and fallen darkly upon me. I went away from England, and little by little, the consciousness of all I had lost came upon me. I mourned for my child wife, taken from her blooming world so young. I mourned for Steerforth, who might have won the love and admiration of thousands, as he'd won mine long ago. I mourned for the broken heart that had found rest in the stormy sea and for the wandering remnants of the simple home where I'd heard the night wind blowing when I was a child. When I look back on this time of my life, I seem to be recalling a dream. I passed through palaces, cathedrals, temples and castles, but I saw them as a dreamer might, hardly conscious of what was before me. I had been away nearly a year when I arrived in Switzerland, where a packet of letters from home awaited me, and in the evening before sunset I took them into the valley to read. The first letter was from Agnes. I know how great your sadness must be, but I know too that you have a nature that will turn sorrow to good. Through your grief you will be strengthened and exalted. I am so proud of you. I glory in your fame, and I know well that you will go on to greater things. 
Remember how you overcame the great unhappiness you suffered as a child. Trust in God, who has taken your innocent darling to his rest. Wherever you go, remember your sister is always at your side. Proud of all you've done, but prouder yet of what you will do. I put the letter in my breast, and I laid my weary head upon the grass, and wept as I had not wept since Dora died. From that time, I began to work again. Traddles arranged for the publication of all I sent him, and my reputation grew. And so, at last, I returned home. I had been away three years. I arrived in London on a wintry autumn evening and went to Gray's Inn, where Traddles had told me he had taken chambers. Good God, it's Copperfield! Copperfield it is! <laughs> <laughs> All well, my dear Traddles? All well, my dear, dear Copperfield! Oh, my dear fella, how glad I am to see you! I never was so rejoiced, never! Oh, good gracious me! When did you come? Uh, where have you come from? What have you been doing? Oh, to think you should have been so nearly coming home, as you must have been, and not at the ceremony! What ceremony? Good gracious me, didn't you get my last letter? Not if it referred to any ceremony. Why, my dear Copperfield, I am married. Married? Lord bless me, yes. What? To Sophie, by her father, the Reverend Horace, <laughs> down in Devonshire. <laughs> Sophie, see whom we have here. Why, <laughs> Mr Copperfield. Mrs Traddles. Oh, what a delightful <laughs> reunion this is. Oh, God bless my soul, how happy I am. And so am I. <laughs> and I'm sure I am. Oh. Sophie is an extraordinary housekeeper, you know. We have her sisters staying with us now, and you won't believe how those girls are stowed away. How many young ladies are there here, then? Five. Five? Yes. The whole set of chambers is only three rooms, but we put three girls in that room and two what? in that. <laughs> There's a little place in the roof. It's a very nice room when you're up there, Mr Copperfield. And Sophie papered it herself to surprise me. And it's ours at present. Uh, my love, will you fetch the girls? Yes, Tom. Oh, she really is the dearest girl. I went down to Devon, Copperfield, and I pointed out to the Reverend Horace Crooler, who's most excellent clergyman and ought to be a bishop, that Sophie and I had been engaged for a long time and that my most earnest desire was to be useful to the family. So if I got on in the world and anything should happen to him or Mrs Crooler, I'd be a parent to the girls. <sighs> Well, he was most sympathetic. And though Mrs. Crooler took it rather hard at first, well, she couldn't forgive me for depriving her of her child, we brought her round in the end. <laughs> and so, my dear Copperfield, I'm now as happy as it's possible to be. I returned to my night's lodgings, envying my friend his happiness. As I sat before the fire, thinking about him, I gradually fell to tracing faces in the live coals, and remembering my own past life. Goodbye, Davy. My poor child. Goodbye. You're going to London, David, to begin the world on your own account. Young or old, Davy, as long as I'm alive, you'll find a room here for you, as if I expected you directly, men. Mr. Dick, you will consider yourself guardian, jointly with me, of this child. Oh, Agnes. You're my good angel. Always my good angel. If I were, there's one thing I'd set my heart on. What is that? On warning you against your bad angel. Daisy, if anything should ever separate us, you must think of me at my best. As years went on, my boy would have wearied of his child wife. It is better as it is. Wherever you go, remember your sister is always at your side. Proud of what you've done, but prouder yet of what you will do. Oh, Trotwood, blind, blind, blind. The faces in the fire faded. Their voices were subdued. Suddenly, I saw the truth that my undisciplined heart had never recognised. Agnes. I had thought of her as my sister. I had taught her to think so of herself. 
But now, in my loneliness, I knew that I loved her, not as a brother, and that I could have been blessed beyond measure if I could have made her my wife. Too late. I could not speak to her. I could not bear to lose the smallest part of her sisterly affection, as I must do if I sought to change that affection so long established to something else. The time was past. I had deservedly lost her. Blind, blind, blind. Next day, my aunt and Mr. Dick and my dear old nurse Peggotty who was now their housekeeper, received me with tears of joy, and my aunt and I, when left alone, talked far into the night. When she had given me news of all our old friends, she sat back and looked at me thoughtfully. Trot, when are you going to Canterbury? I'll get a horse and ride over tomorrow, unless you'll go with me. No, I mean to stay where I am. I'd have stopped off there today if I'd been coming to anyone but you. Oh, my old bones would have kept till tomorrow. <laughs> you will find Mr. Wickfield a white-haired old man, but a better man in all respects. <laughs> and Agnes... Yes? You will find her as good and as beautiful as she has always been. If I knew higher praise, I would give it to her. Useful and happy. That's what she wished to be. How could she be otherwise? Has... Has Agnes any lover? She might have been married twenty times since you've been gone. No doubt. But is there anyone who's worthy of her? Uh, I suspect she has an attachment, Trot. A prosperous one? Oh, I cannot say. I've no right to tell you even so much. She's never confided in me. But... Uh, I suspect it. I suspect she is going to be married. If it is so, she'll tell me in her own good time. I... I have always confided everything to her. She will confide in me. Ah, Trotwood. Seeing you again brings back such memories of bygone days. <laughs> My part in them as much matter for regret, but I would not cancel them, for that would cancel such fidelity, such a child's love. Hush, Father. I understand you, sir. But no one knows, not even you, how much she has undergone. Dear Agnes, uh, uh, forgive me. <laughs> I'm an old man now, and I keep early hours. You have much to say to each other without me. Hmm? Good night, then, sir. Good night. Good night, my darling. Good night, hmm. Papa. Ah. <laughs> Do you mean to go away again, Trot? What does my sister say to that? I hope not. Then I have no such intention. <laughs> Since you ask me, I think you ought not. Your reputation is growing... If I could spare my brother, perhaps the time could not. What I am, you have made me. I have made you? Yes. You remember the night Dora died? So young, so loving. Can I ever forget? I've often thought of you since, as you were then, ever directing me to higher things. That's how I shall see you till the day I die, my dearest sister. But we've spoken of me, and you've told me nothing of your own life in all this lapse of time. What have I to tell? Papa is well, as you see. We are here in our home. Our anxieties are gone. When you know that, you know all. All? Is there nothing else? You have a secret. Let me share it. Trotwood. If there's someone to whom you've given the treasure of your love, don't shut me out. Let me be your friend, your brother, <laughs> your... Agnes, Agnes, dearest, what have I done? I am not well. I am not myself. 
Let me go away. I will write to you. Oh, I can't bear to see you like this and think that I've been the cause. Oh, my dearest girl, dearer to me than anything in life, if you're unhappy, let me share your unhappiness. For whom do I live now, if not for you? I am not myself another time. I, I must say more. For heaven's sake, let's not mistake each other after all these years. I must speak plainly. If you think I could not resign you to a dearer protector of your own choosing, dismiss the thought. Oh, no. You're... You're mistaken. If sometimes in the past I have been unhappy, the feeling has passed away. If I have any secret, it is no new one and is not what you think. I cannot reveal it. Agnes. Yes? When I came here today, I, I never thought I would confess this. But if I have really any hope that... that I might ever call you something more than sister, very different from sister... Agnes? I cannot speak. My dearest girl, please tell me if I have any hope... I went away loving you. I stayed away loving you. I came home loving you. Oh, Trotwood. Tell me, please. That was my secret. I have loved you all my life. Goodness me, Trot. Uh, who is this you are bringing here? Agnes, of course. <laughs> so I see. Agnes, my dear. Dear Miss Trotwood. I've been telling Agnes what you told me. What? Then you did wrong. You're not angry. I'm sure you won't be when you learn that Agnes isn't unhappy in any attachment. But she is going to be married. What? Trotwood! <laughs> Aunt Betsy. <laughs> Bless you both. We were married a fortnight later. Traddles and Sophie and Dr. and Mrs. Strong were the only guests at our quiet wedding. We left them full of joy and drove away together. I held in my arms the source of every good aspiration I've ever had, the circle of my life, my own, my wife. At last I can tell you something more. Let me hear it. The night Dora died, she sent for me. I remember. She told me she had but one wish and left me a last charge. What was that? That only I should occupy her vacant place. Now my memories are nearly finished, but there is one incident more. Agnes and I had been married ten happy years. We were blessed in each other and blessed in our children. One spring night, a stranger came to see us, a hale, grey-haired old man, whom I recognised at last as Mr. Peggotty. That's always been in my mind, ma'am. As I must come and see Master Davy and your own sweet blooming self and your wedded happiness <laughs> afore I got to be too old. <laughs> and how have you fared, Mr. Peggotty? Have you been fortunate? Very fortunate, sir. We've worked, and maybe we've lived a little hard at first, but what with sheep farming and stock farming, we've always thrived. And Emily? I wonder if you could see my Emily now. Whether you'd know her. <laughs> Is she changed, sir? Well, uh, I don't know. I see her every day, but... Hard times, I've thought so. Uh, a slight figure. Kind of worn. Soft, sorrowful blue eyes. A pretty head. Leaning a little down. A quiet voice and way. Timid, almost. 
much, Emily. And is Martha with you yet? Martha got married. <laughs> <laughs> a young man, a farm labourer, made off of her. As she spoke to me to tell him her true story. I did. And they were married. And they live 400 miles oh. away from any voices but their own and the singing birds. <laughs> and Mrs Gummidge? <laughs> well, would you believe it? A ship's cook even made offer for Mrs. Gummidge. <laughs> I'm gormed, and I can't say no further than that. <laughs> and what did she say? Well, if you believe me, Mrs. Gummidge, instead of saying thank you, but I hadn't going to change my condition at my time of life, <laughs> she upped with a bucket and was standing by and laid it over that there ship's cook's head till he hung out for help. <laughs> and I went and rescued off him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and last, not least, Mr. McCorber. Oh, uh, He's paid off every obligation he incurred here, even to Traddle's bill. So we take it for granted he's doing well. Oh. But what's the latest news of him? Well, Mr. McCorber turned to with a will, sir. I've seen that there bald head of his a perspiring in the sun till I almost thought it would have melted away. <laughs> and now he's a magistrate. A magistrate? Eh? Oh, yes, sir. Now, I brought this to show you. Port Middle Bay, give him a dinner. Wilkins Micawber, Esquire, our distinguished guest, the ornament of our town. Uh -huh. Well, something has turned up at last. <laughs> Mr. Peggotty lived with us for the remainder of his stay. Agnes and I parted from him aboard ship when he sailed, and we shall never part from him more on earth. Now I look back once more, for the last time before I end my story. Faces crowd upon me. My aunt... An old woman of fourscore, but upright yet. Peggotty, my good old nurse, her cheeks and arms, once so hard and red, shriveled now, but her finger still rough as a nutmeg grater. My youngest child catches at it as it totters from my aunt to her. My aunt is godmother now to a real living Betsy Trotwood and spoils her mightily. I see an old man at my aunt's side, making giant kites and promising to finish his memorial soon. And I see Traddles, prosperous now, but exactly the same simple, unaffected fellow he ever was. These faces fade away, but one face is above them and beyond them all. And that remains. I turn my head and see it in its beautiful serenity beside me. Oh, Agnes, oh, my soul, so may thy face be by me when I close my life indeed. So may I, when realities are melting from me like the shadows which I now dismiss, still find thee near me pointing upward.